Nice to meet you. Hello. Good, good morning, all. If uh, you could take a seat, we're going to get this event uh, started. My name is Nathan Pick. I'm the Director of Advocacy at ACINA and handle the day-to-day -day of the Beyond the Runway Coalition. We want to thank you for joining us for Thinking Beyond the Runway, a look at how airports help our economy take off. This is an event that's uh, part of Infrastructure Week 2015. To get this uh, panel kicked off, I want to invite ACINA President and CEO Kevin Burke to the podium. Kevin? Thank you, Nathan. Good morning, everybody. Well, we first time we did this, we were in Reagan um, National Airport. And what a great venue to start this. And we had zero members of our coalition. Now we are upwards over 30 members of this coalition. And here we are. Uh, two years ago, if you said to me, Kevin, in two years, you're going to be standing in front of a group of people, some of whom you don't know, some of whom you do, and you're going to be celebrating Infrastructure Week. I would say, really? Why would I be doing that for? But here I am this morning. And what a great way to celebrate Infrastructure Week by talking about airports and talking about how all of the groups in this room are impacted by FAA reauthorization. So when we started, like I say, we're at ground zero, we're over 30. Who knows where FAA reauthorization is going to go this year, uh, considering, and I know I'm going to raise Pete's blood pressure by mentioning <laughs> Highway Bill. And, and he's, he's loaded for bear on that subject. But let me get throw some numbers out at you this morning before we start. And the drill we're going to have here is I'm going to do some brief intro remarks. Then I'm going to ask our speakers to introduce themselves. Oh, I'm going to introduce them. They can tell, let's talk for five minutes about what their uh, goals and objectives are working with this coalition. And then we're going to get into a Q&A. And I encourage everybody in the room to ask questions. That's what we're here. And that's why I put our consultants in the front seat here, Steve, because you, you have to ask questions too. So right now, US airports take care of about 750 million passengers and uh, 27 million metric tons of cargo. A lot of work. $1.1 trillion in economic activity, which is 7% of our GDP, and 1.2 million workers that are working directly at airports, uh, 9.6 million jobs to support airports. So that's a big number. The challenge, here's the challenge, folks. We're at 750 million now. Um, in the next 20 years, we're going to be upwards of a billion people per year going through our airports. So the average age of a U.S. airport now is about 40 years old. Our youngest large hub airport just turned 20 this year, and that's Denver International. Now, if you look at the importance of infrastructure, and our youngest airport just turned 20, there's the reason why we're standing here today talking about the need for uh, in, um, to modernize the PFC and maintaining AIP and the FAA reauthorization bill. So when I first met all of you folks as presidents, we talked about capital needs. Our association had done a capital needs study. And in the next five years, um, our needs study indicated that we have $75 billion in capital needs for airports between now and five years from now. That works out to be about $15 billion a year just to keep our heads above water. That's a big number. Another reason why reauthorization is so important to us. So what is our goal? Modernizing the PFC should be clear and simple. It's only a $4 increase in what people are paying now. And when I compare that to the revenue that the airlines are making right now, we I have nothing against airlines making revenue. A healthy airline makes for a healthy airport, you would think. But the fact remains is that when it comes to the PFC, the airlines say, if you increase it by $4, people will stop flying, or they won't be flying enough. Then you look at it and say, well, OK, that's interesting. So do you think about the passenger when you charge the non-frequent flyer $25 a bag? Or do you charge them for a change fee or a cancellation fee or for blankets or for peanuts or, in some airlines, the pressurized versus the unpressurized part of the plane? <laughs> uh, I use that in being facetious, but my guess is somebody's probably thinking about that. So as we discussed earlier, a community around an airport thrives. Why? because of what the airport brings to the community. Not only from its inception when you build it, for many of the people in the room here are, who are in the business of working with airports and other infrastructure issues, this brings jobs and money to a local community. And all you have to do is look at major airports, uh, smaller airports, and medium hub airports, and what goes on around those airports, economic activity. And our job at ACINA, working with this coalition, is to make certain 
that that economic activity continues and that the transportation um, industry and, and the folks on Capitol Hill give us a fair hearing, a fair hearing on why the, the, um, the passenger facility charge needs to be modernized. So with us today, and, I'm, and please tell me if I'm excluding, I'm not excluding anybody, but we have retail, restaurants, hotels, travel, construction, engineering. When I took this job back last year, 15 months ago, I told our board of directors the only way you're going to get serious attention on this issue is not making it an airport versus airline issue, but to make it an issue between the airports, all the component parts of an airport, and then the airlines, and convince Congress that this is a local issue, and that is rebranding and also resubscribing what we consider as local. Get the attention of members of Congress to say that the passenger facility charge is a local fee that passengers pay, clear and simple, for the use of the airport. People who never fly never pay it. Very simple. It's not the T word, and I won't mention it publicly. It's a user fee, clear and simple. So with that introduction here, um, I'd like to introduce our panelists. To my immediate left is, for the second time in Lawson, we appreciate you being here, Lawson Bader, who is from the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Next to him is Pete Ruan from the American Road and Transportation Builders Association. And last but not least, my colleague in the um, airport business here, T.J. Schultz, uh, who's the president and CEO of Airport Consultants Council. And I'd like to remind all of our associate members of ACINA how important the associate members are to our organization and how important it is the collaboration between our two groups as we move forward on issues like this. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to sit down and I'm going to ask each of our panelists to give a five-minute intro about their organization, why it's important, this issue is important to them, and then we'll start a conversation. I have a series of questions I'll be asking them, and then I encourage all of you to be able to ask questions to them as well. So we have about an hour. I want to thank our hosts, obviously, for uh, allowing us to use this great room. Uh, we filled the entire room on a beautiful day like that. Obviously, people aren't playing golf today. Um, <laughs> If I weren't celebrating infrastructure, I'd be playing golf today. <laughs> so I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to ask Lawson to begin the process. And um, sure. go ahead, Lawson. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, my, uh, my reason for being involved is very simple. Uh, one, ideas matter, and partnerships matter. And that's how this town works. The, the third reason is that I'm a, uh, I'm a client. I spend way too much time in airports. And I will confess, about a month and a half ago, I was driving up the GW Parkway. I had not actually been on an airplane in four weeks. And I actually pulled into National Airport short-term parking to walk in solely so I could just breathe the air. <laughs> and that is probably a sad, sad, yeah. sad, sick, disturbing <laughs> issue. So this is actually my public cry for help. Um, actually, there you go. See, that's what it boils down to. But, uh, yes, I like airports, no question about it. Uh, but, you know, why is a, it's a libertarian free market think activist group doing uh, in a town like this? Uh, the simple reason, as I said, ideas matter. Uh, the problem we have in this city uh, and, and expanded in other places <coughs> is we are full of politicians who tend to pay for things through the T word, as you, as you mentioned for the simple reason that it tends to obscure the actual costs and it sends the benefits uh, in ways that are not always understood uh, or they are sent to very specific constituencies. And uh, accountability is, of course, much harder to implement in those, in those uh, circumstances. The, uh, the problem is that the T word has become far more challenging and even toxic in some ways. And so the... Uh, it makes it much more challenging to sort of come up with revenue ideas. Well, for us, it's very simple. When you have a government service and you don't really know what it costs, you have a bigger, a bigger challenge. And ideally, a user fee, as you said, is fundamentally the best and most efficient, most fair economic way of both uh, figuring out what you're actually getting and what you're paying for and what you can do. It's a very simple, basic economic understanding. Uh, they're already, they already exist in other areas of transportation. Why can't we simply make this more available for the airports? Uh, and it is a sense of fairness. You get what you pay for, you pay for what you get. That, to us, is one of the fundamental, most important aspects of sort of tax policy, revenue policy. 
the, uh, you know, there are very, some very specifics as to why we, we like the PFC, why we think it should be indexed to inflation, et cetera, from an investment standpoint. Uh, we also are not big fans of the large regulatory complex scheme that exists in Washington, D.C. When you take it out of Washington, you put it back into local authority, it's a much more effective and much more efficient way of getting exactly the money you pay for to what you need to invest in. It's that simple. You cut out a very significant bureaucratic aspect of it. It's also a very important investment signal that you who are involved in the business need. Um, and that's uh, to minimize that makes it more difficult over time. In our opinion, sort of become more autonomous and to somewhat disengage from the federal funding mechanism. Um, it sort of comes down to that that basic. Um, uh, it's the right economic idea. Uh, it is necessary to be part of a coalition. We as an activist think tank and oftentimes work in a political world in, e in easier ways or more effective ways than sometimes industry can. And so it's a natural opportunity for us to play that role and to help out. Uh, and it's simply the right thing to do. Well, that's what I like to hear, the right thing to do. <laughs> and speaking of the right thing to do, and that it was to have my friend Pete Ruan be here because uh, Pete and his team have been actively involved on the highway bill, which has probably got to be one of the most frustrating processes anybody has ever gone through um, here in town, other than working in Ag Bill, uh, which is even probably worse, but that's the subject for another day. So, Pete, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, um, hey, we dig airports too, man. <laughs> uh, I figured. In, in fact, we do it literally. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I represent the American Road and Transportation Builders Association. Uh, we're 113 years old, and uh, we're the ones who design and build uh, airports all over the world. And it's a huge uh, part of our business, and that's, that's perhaps one would say that might be our selfish reason for being involved. But as some of you know, I love to tell folks that uh, our, our selfish interests, uh, ironically, truthfully, coincide with the public interest. How many groups can say that? <laughs> you know, we say it loudly and clearly all any time we can. So thanks for inviting us, and, and uh, I'll be brief. I'm reminded of, of uh, you know, this week people were calling it Infrastructure Week. Well, guess what? Every week is Infrastructure Week <laughs> for us, you know? I, I'd like to refer to this week as D-Week. You know what that means? Defining week. Drop dead week. <laughs> because the Congress, seven days from now, on at least the highway and transit legislation, they got to make some decisions. And it you know, looks, they'll make them, but I'm not sure they're going to be uh, the best way we want to see it made. Um, I'm reminded also of, of uh, past experiences that what we're facing right now. I, I gave a presentation in Texas in the year 2005, the very day President Bush signed Safety Lou. <clears throat> and uh, I gave the same presentation in 2012 uh, before a group called the Road Gang, and there's a few of you in the audience that belong to that. And unfortunately, we're at the same place. And you know what I called that presentation? Missed opportunities dressed in cheap tuxedos. And that's what we're looking at again. They're looking at a cheap way, put us off, maybe long term. Uh, and all this applies to FAA reauthorization. We're glad to be a member of the coalition. We're longtime believers uh, in working uh, together, and especially with non-traditional allies. We ourselves, like the coalition here, had research done a year ago. Surprised the hell out of people. The results were 62% of the beneficiaries of the road, bridge, and transit program were non-highway, non bridge, transit-related folks. And that's, duh, you know. Same with the airports. You know, you say, oh, it's the airports that benefit. It's the airline. No way the whole freaking world benefits. That's who benefits. And I don't use the word modernize. That's a euphemism. Increase the PFC. Come on. Okay? <laughs> Increase the bloody thing. You know, it's, it is antiquated. It's, forget it. AIP, we, we don't just want to see it stable. We want to see that increase too. 
our members, believe it or not, we have a thousand county engineers among our members. They manage local airports. Our people, as I said earlier, we design and build them. So we want to see that program increased as well. But hey, the way to get it done is what you're doing right now, is to get a group, as you've done this past year, together from varied interests and tell the world that, you know, this issue transcends, transcends the narrow interests of any one particular member of the coalition. It's for the benefit of our economy, the nation, the world. Uh, I think you're beyond the runway is a great way to describe it. This is far beyond the runway, and we're going to support you all the way. Uh, you all know we, you know, I'd like to describe this town as a fact-free zone. It remains so, unfortunately. <laughs> but one of the things you've already done with your research is, is get the facts out there. And once in a while, Congress pays attention to the facts when you have them in a corner. And, and that's what this is all about. They'll do the right thing uh, if we continue to do our thing, which is keep the heat on them, keep the pressure on them, especially at the grassroots level, and eventually they will do the right thing. So let me stop there, and I'll be glad to get into this a little more. So Pete, I'm waiting for the balloons to come out of the ceiling here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, obviously, he wasn't part of our original messaging part about <laughs> keeping the increase and calling it modernizing. But Pete, you can say whatever the hell you want. That's good. Hey, it works. <laughs> and I will. <laughs> okay, last but not least, TJ. Sure. I think Pete stopped reading the talking points, what, about 20 years ago. Uh, but I would have nothing uh, other than what you're bringing to the table today. Uh, first, I want to start off by thanking Kevin uh, for standing this up on this important week. Uh, Kevin's done a fantastic job with his staff to really raise the level of importance of this issue that we're talking about today. And also need to acknowledge the fact that you are partnering with AAAE and your uh, colleague uh, Todd Hopley and the fact that the airports are coming together and again elevating this issue and the importance and bringing the facts to the table. So why am I here? Well, the Airport Consultants Council, we represent about 200 plus private companies that are hired by Kevin's airports to really do everything they need to get done to have an efficient airport. Our members range in size from single one-person shop to 10 people, small firms, to multinational companies that have tens of thousands of employees. Our members work at airports of all sizes across the country, everywhere from the very large uh, capacity airports that right now are pretty much bulging at the, at the seams. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. They're also working at a number of mid to smaller size airports that while they may not be capacity constrained, at least at this time, their facilities are 40 years plus old. So what do we need to do in order to keep those up to date, to keep them maintained, to keep them running efficiently? A number of our members also work at a number of very small airports in local communities. And let me tell you, the past five to seven years since the last reauthorization has been tough out there. We have all seen the uh, budgetary pressures on the federal level. State and local has been worse and state and local funding for smaller airports has been very difficult to come by. It's, been, it's become very difficult even for uh, smaller airports to meet the federal match requirements. So I am really looking forward to a robust discussion today. I will talk a little bit about some of the issues that we see and some of the priorities in reauthorization in just a little bit. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to start off by talking about how we got here, but the messaging of trying to convince members of Congress who for years have thought this issue to be a tax <laughs> and not a user fee. And I'm going to start off with you, Lawson, yep. because one of the challenges we had was in messaging this to people who would normally look at this as a tax and say, there's no way I'm going to support this because I could be challenged in a primary if I'm viewed as increasing a tax. Um, th the way we tried to message this, and I think we've become successful, is to take, take it away from the idea of tax and put it into the issue of user fee and the fact that these funds are local. Mm -hmm. They don't go into any big funds. So, Lawson, I'm going to start with you. I mean, it's very important that we've had a couple of victories here. Um, you know, and one thing is Grover Norquist announced his support for the airlines position, and we quickly followed up by getting two major conservative groups to support us on PSCs, which is an enormous help. We appreciate that. So let's talk a little <laughs> bit about that. I've, I've heard from Grover. Uh, I'm sure um, you have. Yeah. <laughs> I've actually seen him tomorrow on something unrelated. So I won't tell, tell him. him I send my best. I'll send, yeah. Tell him I sent your best. <laughs> Happy to do that. That's what makes it fun <laughs> in this town. Um, you know, when we, when we 
for us, it's just a clear talking point about what taxation is and what it is not. Uh, you know, when, when we use a government service and we pay for it, that's a user fee. When, uh, if we don't get what we pay for, uh, or if that fee is uh, involuntary, or it is redirected elsewhere, it's a tax. Now, putting on my little acerbic libertarian hat, we call that legal theft. Um, a user fee is not. A user fee, as I mentioned, is you pay for what you get, plain and simple. And that is the most transparent system uh, in existence. And more importantly, the group that is collecting said user fees are the ones who actually are putting it to where it needs to be and why you're paying it in the first place. And it is taking it out of, as I mentioned, sort of the larger Washingtonian structure into a much more local market. Co congressmen like to think of local markets frequently. Um, but for us, if we just lay out the one, the two, and the three as this is a tax, and this is not a tax, and it's very simple, and show me how this is actually a tax. Um, and when we start to put it in those terms, um, we start to see a little bit of uncomfortable uh, bit, especially with the redirected elsewhere aspect. So user fee is very straight and simple, and almost any economist you ask of any political persuasion will say the exact same thing. Pete. Tell us your unvarnished view of this, because I know you started off by saying different message, but has this been an issue at all in your, in your um, challenge with the highway bill and other experiences you've had with the T&I committee or the, the Senate Transportation Committee? Uh, it's, it's an issue uh, in terms of how you describe the, the uh, way you're going to finance uh, infrastructure. Um, and we've always called it a user fee. Uh, and our enemies and, and those who oppose uh, any investment, we also call it investment, you know, uh, they call it a tax. And, and I, I think Lawson has described the difference very, very well, and I, I agree with that. Uh, and, but, but, you know, th this town, the members of Congress sometimes, uh, the media, some certain parts of the media, just love to, to you know, uh, draw this whole issue as, as, you know, a tax increase, and, and it's, you know, I think that's so simplistic. We, we like to emphasize the return on investment of what you're getting out of this, and, and there's just, I mean, you have to be a fool, a dead fool, <laughs> not to recognize the power and the return on investing in our airports. Give me a break. Who can look you in the eye? I mean, look, we got some boondoggles in the highway and bridge area over the years. We've had some, and the press has leaped all over those. Airports, I remember when Denver was started, then people were, you know, yapping away that this was going to be a boondoggle. Well, <laughs> look at it now. Are you kidding me? You know, airports are, are not boondoggles. They, they are central to the nation and the world's economic development. And, and the real issue is transparency and accountability. Okay, if you're gonna raise anything, where's it going? How's it gonna be used? What is the return on it? Those are the, we love to answer those questions. Because we all the, you know, the truth is on our side, which doesn't matter half the time around here. <laughs> but it is. And by emphasizing the returns you're getting on almost any airport, investment, in my mind, is, is the way to communicate. Well, they're long-term public structures that will be up long after these members of Congress have left Congress. And uh, the better you build it, the better it is, and the more you have to keep maintaining them. And if we've seen anything in this country, and Pete, you've seen this firsthand, if you don't put the funds in to maintain our highways and bridges and tunnels and ports, um, then we're a mess, as we are today. So, TJ, from your perspective, from your perch, um, in our end of the, in your end of the business, what are your thoughts on this, on the messaging and, and how uh, your members are able to translate our messaging into uh, conversations with members of Congress? Yeah. <clears throat> at, the, at the end of the day, you know, we're living in difficult times here in Washington, and they continue to become more challenging as we go on. We've seen um, budget cuts, very tight uh, um, financial uh, issues and, and deficits. Uh, we've seen life under sequestration. You remember that two years ago when we had sequestration, and really the most publicly visible impact, I think, from that sequestration was on FAA. 
because they had to uh, um, uh, furlough some air traffic controllers. They, cut, they, they shut down a number of air traffic control towers. Uh, and what that resulted in was um, delays in the system. So Congress, in a miracle, acted, I think, within a week to pass a bill that took $250 million out of the airport grant funding to help shore up air traffic control and fix that problem. So we're looking at sequestration coming up again in 2016 unless something's done. And what astounds me, Kevin, is with this PFC issue, we are handing Congress something that has no impact on the federal budget and allows the communities to be able to react and meet their specific needs without any impact on the federal budget. And that just astounds me that that's getting lost in this whole discussion. Well, the challenge um, has been trying to erase the past and what has been inbred in, um, in the minds of people who have been uh, told that uh, by charging more on a passenger for a passenger is actually a tax on the passenger, so therefore that's bad. Um, when I, I've been to 46 airports in 15 months, and I've seen every airport, every size, shape, and matter, and the expression is in our industry, you've been to one airport, you've been to one airport. They're all different. Um, I've seen firsthand why we need uh, to modernize or increase the PFC and why AIP is so important to medium and small hub airports. Um, it's very, very obvious. What doesn't appear, what, what stuns me is that members of Congress know exactly where every airport is in their district and every senator knows the, the airports in their state and they fly through them so often that you would think they would take notice of the fact that we're not asking for a handout here. We're asking for the ability to be able to modernize our airports, to accommodate inbound traffic. Now, I mentioned earlier in my remarks that we have the biggest growth has been in international. And uh, our friends at US Travel have estimated that the average person coming into the United States um, through an international uh, passageway like a Miami or a Chicago or New York spends about $4,300 per capita. Now, you do the math on that, and that's a heck of a lot of money that goes into the US economy. Now, do they want to come to an airport that's half falling down? They have to wait on long lines to get through customs. Um, do they want to have outdated bathrooms? Uh, do they want to have unsafe um, uh, parking garages? Um, uh, there's nothing unsafe on the airfield. The airports never compromise on safety when it comes to the airfield. But yet they're stressed with the fact that they need money to rebuild runways and taxiways and things like that. So I, mean, I want to ask the group this. Your experiences with Congress, and I know we, we like to joke <laughs> of the fact that you know, it's hard to say why they, they have a Senate or a House Intelligence Committee. Is that an oxymoron here? But uh, on this issue here, you would think this would be, as, as uh, TJ said, a slam dunk. We're talking about $4. $4 that goes on a ticket. And what do you think the airlines are taking this up as their mantra? And I'm going to start at the other end. TJ, you tell me. <laughs> Tell the group here. I have noticed, and if you all are reading the industry press, um, the airlines are very energized about this and very coordinated in a way that I hadn't seen in previous authorizations. And frankly, I think it's a testament to the work that you are doing under Airports United and AAA and others to show the needs that are out there. I mean, we're talking uh, your needs analysis, $75 billion equates to about $15 billion per year. When you look at AIP and PFC combined, I think we're talking about $6 billion or so. Um, so, it, it, what was the question again? <laughs> I, I got lost in it. <laughs> the question is, why, why do you think this is such a problem for the airlines? Uh, I think it comes down to competition, Kevin. Um, at the end of the day, uh, you'll find airports where airlines thoroughly enjoy the PFC. If it's helping to update their facilities, their terminals, their gates, uh, where they might have some problems if it helps some of their competitors. And let me tell you, airports are doing all they can to attract competition, to get more carriers to come to their facilities. And what that does is benefit the local communities, because when you get more carriers coming in, prices go down. You see that here, and even in the Washington, D.C. area, the three airports just going at it as far as competition, trying to uh, draw service. And that benefits the communities. It benefits the, uh, the economy in general. 
So that's why I think they're running scared. Pete, you see any perils with this issue with what you're dealing with on, uh, on the highway bill? Yes, I, and I, I have no insight as to what motivates the airlines on, on anything. Um, <laughs> they, I, I do find it kind of interesting to contrast that position, or their position, I guess, with that of the trucking industry in the United States, which uh, for, and, and it's not a jailhouse conversion either, by the way. They have mindfully and aggressively articulated a position in recent years uh, in favor of as much of a, a 25 cent increase in the gasoline and diesel tax, uh, which they co will cost them, you know, zillions. And contrast that with the fact that our friends in another mode are opposed to increasing fees. And I, I don't, now the truckers want to see the roads and bridges and, and all the, you know, things associated with that improved, modernized. And they're willing to pay for it. Uh, and so, you know, I have no, no insight beyond that about by what the motives of the airlines are, but I, I think the, the way to deal with that is, is the way you're dealing with it and, and deal with it forthrightly and aggressively that, hey, you know, that our view on, on these user fee increases, uh, you know, I, I like to use a vulgar metaphor, but, you know, I don't apologize to anybody. You know, it, it's a fart in a hurricane. I mean, come on, it's going to be lost. Who are you kidding? <laughs> Is that going to really affect behavior? People, when they travel, they want to get from here to there. Cost is important, but if they got to get from here to there, they're going to do it. And, and I think the things we're talking about, the numbers we're talking about, are modest. I mean, what's parallel with us? The price of gasoline is still down a buck twenty. Right now, it's two sixty-three, average in the United States. You talk about missed opportunities, what I was referring to earlier. You know, it's, it's just, this is the time to do it. The case is solid, and just continue to march. So, so Lawson, with your interaction with, with the conservative side of things, so with, with members of Congress, what do members of Congress talk to you about in terms of their support or opposition or questions they might have on this? The uh, nomenclature matters. Words matter. We teach our children this. Unfortunately, those same children then grow up to be politicians. And both remember that lesson, but also forget that lesson. Um, and the reality is, as I mentioned, that the use of the word tax in this political environment is especially among the more conservative-leaning folks is completely and utterly toxic. You turn on the tax light and everybody runs. And that, to me, is the single biggest challenge and, and the best opportunity that I and a few others have to try to move beyond that understanding that this is not a revenue enhancement. So all the other phrases that they try to utilize rather than tax. And it's, a, it's an intellectual sticking point. Um, and that, again, that's probably the, the best benefit I can offer this group is to sort of hit repeatedly members of Congress and others that it, it's not this, it's quite the opposite. But it is that um, it is unfortunate that our political environment has become that way. Um, but for us, it's we are just going to become the greatest economic teachers we possibly can be in the next six months. Um, and uh, and once you see a few examples of you know the freight industry, railroad industry, they modernize with balloons or whatever, uh, with a lot of their own money. Um, and that metaphor starts to also work, although your metaphor, I've got to get into one of my columns in the next week and a half. I'm not sure how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to somehow get it in there. I'll get it by my editor, though. Um, anyway, so now it's, the, it's just hammering on, on the, def, 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 the definition and the differentiation. Um, and it's unfortunately slow, but we can get just a few, or you get one or two key people, then that's, that's the political challenge. The, the tailcoat will follow afterwards. So on that point, uh, Chairman Schuster challenged us <laughs> to show him and members of the committee um, what's the need. Tell us why you need to increase the PSC. Show us what's wrong. Show us the airports that have not been able to either put projects together or complete projects or in many cases extend out projects which cost more money. Um, so we did that. 
we provided them uh, back in St. Patrick's Day, actually, the day I appeared on the aviation subcommittee, and somehow the airlines got that before the chairman did. I don't know how that happened. But in any event, we presented this to the committee. It said, well, we've, you've asked us to do this, and this is just a sample of airports in the United States that have had to uh, scrounge for money to do basic things. I'll give you a case in point. Las Vegas completed a major terminal uh, last year, and because of that, it's a beautiful terminal, it's a common use terminal, which means that any airline can use any gate, and electronically it can change from United to US Air to American, and those gates are uh, used and paid for by uh, rent and lease agreements, but the reality is it, it costs billions of dollars. That airport now um, is maxed out on their PFC into, I believe, 2024. So that means that they will, if they have to make any other improvements in their airports, they're not going to be able to use the services of the people who are in this room, either to build or fix, because they don't have the money to be able to use the PSC, which is used to pay the bonding that was required that you do large infrastructure projects. So one of the challenges for us as a group is to convince members of Congress, again, it's a local issue, two, it's a jobs issue, Three, that if you keep ignoring infrastructure, you do it at your peril. And I always think it's a great analogy that Pete uses, is that the very industry that's regulated by the federal government the, uh, the, um, are asking for, which is in my 36 years in Washington, I never thought I'd see the day where, it, where an outside group is actually asking for a tax increase or an increase in a fuel tax to pay for roads because they've calculated if the roads get worse, it's going to harm the trucks they're using, and the expense in fixing those trucks is going to affect commerce, which means they're not going to be able to get their product to their consu uh, the consumer fast enough, so therefore the consumer is not going to pay. All makes perfect sense. But it gets down to the political will of members of Congress to take that leap. Because when this is all said and done within a year or so, people aren't going to remember, well, we increased it to $4, and they'll forget about it. But it's the question of convincing them why $4 is not nothing to worry about. Because if you're taking a $4 increase, and as, as we say in a group here, when you, when you look at how those dollars are used across this entire room, everybody benefits. It's the message. It again gets down to what Lawson said. We, we need to convince the leadership in Congress that this is not a bad thing. That's not going to put your members at risk. That they're not going to be challenged by somebody on the Tea Party because you supported an increase in a passenger fee that's going to allow your airport to modernize, thus put people to work. It's good for the economy. So as we move forward on this, um, and, and I'm going to go to Pete again here, and, and you're uh, working with the committee. How challenging is it for you to change the messaging from your industry with this group? Or, is it, or are they taking all their lead from the leadership right now? Um, the committees are not out front of, of a user fee increase at the moment, uh, both committees in the House and the Senate. Uh, many on the committees, I can tell you from personal discussions, face to face, repeatedly over the months, if not years, uh, are in favor of that. But some of them fall back on, you know, the, the whole, th you were alluding to this, well, there's, there's no will in Congress and so therefore nothing will get done. Uh, well, hold on, buddy. It's your job to create the will. Don't tell me, okay, so what? There's no will in Congress, so therefore nothing will get done. It is our job, of course, as a coalition and as an industry, but it is their job. If there's opposition and they favor it, they need to move. What's different this time, I, I think, you're, you're right about the... the the partisan nature of the beast. Uh, it's unlike uh, past Congresses for, for even beyond 36 years. It's, it's bad news. And, and there's not a whole lot they're interested in getting done uh, for fear that Lawson was referring to that, that this would be used against them in the next election. But we have some research. We're gonna roll out one next week, which I think you can find quite germane to the situation here. Uh, we've analyzed uh, the election results of the last six years in all 50 states. And in 90-some uh, percent of the cases, the people that voted for a user fee increase got reelected. Got reelected. 
So all those who think, oh, we vote for this, we're going to get bounced out baloney. That's not true. Can we steal that from you? We'd love to well, you're that. going to see it momentarily. <laughs> Good. Fifteen states have increased their user fee in the last 24 months. Fifteen states. Many of them because they didn't think the feds were going to do anything. So they're motivated. That Many of them had to do it just to pay off debt. But they did it. And, you know, it, it's a, just like we're in long battle here. It, it hasn't reached the stage of a knife fight yet, but it might. <laughs> And you better be prepared to use it because I, I think that, you know, doing the right thing is, is your strongest message. The nation needs us. Uh, we all need it. And uh, we just got to convince the Congress to come up with the will, <laughs> the, the will <laughs> to do it. You know, Kevin, another component, especially when dealing with the right, is the argument of increasing the PFC as a, as a more effective tool. Uh, is somewhat can be seen as an anti-regulatory action as well, um, especially in a devolving of, of back to local authority, uh, back to the states in some cases, which a lot of congressmen certainly will fall into unless they happen to love the FAA, which, <laughs> which exists. Um, and so, you know, and, and the ability to have that increase as an effective investment tool for raising capital and other things, again, works well with theoretically the conservative side, but... Um, not always, but that is still one of the arguments that we try to take is working in that angle as an anti-regulatory message. So. TJ, with your membership, have you done any economics on the dollar number? Um, if in fact the PFC was raised by certain amounts or not raised at all, and the impact on your membership? We haven't done a specific analysis there, but what I see, Kevin, the when you look at the needs out there, um, the fact. I think it was a fact three study that the FAA just released. It's pretty interesting in that it shows that there are six airports out there that they estimate by 2020 will be at full capacity, if not bulging at the seams. Um, they may sound familiar to you. They're Atlanta, Newark, JFK, LaGuardia, Philadelphia, and San, and San Francisco. So in the pool of, th of the thousands of airports out there, this is a small number. But as you all know, anything, any blip that happens here uh, as they say, when Atlanta gets a cold, the rest of the country gets the flu. <laughs> um, any kind of capacity constraints, delays at these airports have national ramifications. And that's something that we need to hammer home. And, and while we're talking about Congress and the process, while we're certainly supporting the PFC increase, we are also messaging the fact about the need to get this thing done. I mean, I look at what's going on, on the highway side. I've worked on the surface transportation uh, issues for about 10, uh, 10 or 12 years. I used to have hair back then. Look what it did was. <laughs> Look what it did to me. I got nothing. And uh, <laughs> you can tell I'm new to the industry. <laughs> <laughs> Give me it's a year. <laughs> Shave it off. Shave it off. Right. And, and what concerns me is, you know, things are picking up in the industry. Um, I think airports are getting busy. Uh, they're planning. They're starting to build to meet the, the needs. And I feel, I hear from our members, uh, they are hiring like crazy. We do a simple kind of want ads. Our budget uh, in the first quarter exceeded all of last year. They are hiring like crazy. And what concerns me is we're going to get to September 30, and are we going to have a bill? We're probably going to be looking at some kind of extension. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, if we're here next year doing the same thing, right in the heat of the presidential politics. And what's that going to do? What's it done to the state DOTs? I'll tell you what airports are going to do. When they don't know what the future federal funding streams are going to be, if they're living under short-term extensions, they're going to be holding back. They're not going to be planning. They're not going to be building. So it would be extremely unfortunate to take this momentum that's going on right now in the industry. People are hiring like crazy. And to have this process bogged down and really compromise the potential growth here. Government does not understand the devastating effect that uncertainty has on innovation, entrepreneurship, investment, and it affects so many industries, financial services to whatnot. And um, some, t I mean, some cases we'd rather them act in a way that we don't agree with, but at least there's been an action that gives a sense of reality. Um, and unfortunately, the last 
decade or so, uh, you've seen that uncertainty exist, and that's a devastating, paralyzing effect on the economy. Yes, Kevin, let me build on that, uh, Lawson's comment. I, I, and some of you know this, it's uh, the uncertainty factor it is a disaster out there in, in transportation programs generically, in my opinion, specifically with highways, bridges, and transit. You know, we've had 32 extensions. We're about to have our 33rd. That's criminal. Okay, but that uncertainty, the last go around, 21 states canceled programs and projects, put them on hold, delayed them because of the Congress couldn't get it done. Right now, we have about a dozen states. Four have outright canceled. It's some $2 billion of projects. Have, and, then, you know, members of Congress say, oh, well, we got to, you know, we got to move because we're going to save the construction season. Guess what? The construction season's already been lost. Are you kidding me? Who's investing? Who, we're not hiring. We're at a hurt locker, by the way. We still have double-digit unemployment in our sector. So the uncertainty issue is huge, huge. So with that in mind, and, and part of the arguments we have on the Hill are, are those points exactly. If you don't act now, there's a price to pay. So collectively, we have 30 groups here that the message to Congress should be whether it's a highway bill or an FAA reauthorization bill is waiting and thinking too long about this has dire consequences. The thing that amazes me, and actually I'd like to ask the audience about this, is with what the panel has talked about this morning is all this is perfect common sense. So why aren't supposedly intelligent people acting on something that's so common sense and nobody at home, they keep sending these same people to Congress to keep doing the same thing over and over again. Our roads are getting worse, our, uh, worse, our tunnels are getting worse, our airports aren't getting the funding they, needed, they need. But yet this will continue unless somebody pushes these members to talk about the, the real need. Now, one of the things I've observed in my travels is that I think the airport business could do a better job in talking about the projects at the airport and thanking the very people who actually paid for it, the people who go through the airports. I was in an airport in Sarasota, and I said to the airport director, they're doing a beautiful job in part of the terminal. And I said, well, why don't you put up a sign that's saying, this is paid for by the very people who use our airports. Thank you. This is a way to keep our airport modern for our customers as we move forward. Um, that's a message that when people use airports, look at that and go, well, they're thanking us. That's nice. Um, how do we get, the question I, I, I want to ask the audience, how do we get our constituencies to say enough is enough? All right, the roads are falling apart, the airports need work, the tunnels are leaking, and Congress is sitting there as Rome burns. Okay, we have a whole bunch of Nero's sitting up there, just playing the fiddle. And so how do we do that? I mean, we're, we're changing the messaging to some key constituents, and that, that's helpful. But when it get, really gets down to it, John Boehner has to be convinced that this is the right thing to do. Because enough people are saying to John Boehner, John, we can't wait any longer. How do we fix this? And the same with Mitch McConnell over the Senate side. So I want to open it up and ask the, the, the audience here, um, our member, our coalition members, what can we do, be doing better to get them to act? I mean, we've had committee hearings. We've had uh, informational hearings with the committees on both the House and the Senate. We've participated in our friends at AAA have, U.S. Travel. Um, our coalition members have been very supportive. What else can we do to keep their feet to the fire? Who's going to be the first brave one to raise up their hand here? Okay, well, I'm going to ask Steve. Since you're a consultant, I'm a high. Go for it, Steve. Start us <laughs> off. So, the, the question, oh, thank you. A question would be we're all vested interests here in this room today. We all have a stake in what the outcome of this debate is. And how is it the airport community and the, the need to invest in infrastructure can reach the average citizen? How do they engage on an issue like this? Or how do we convince them there's a benefit to them that goes beyond even the, you know, flyers certainly, air travel is certainly, certain. But to the average taxpayer, where's the benefit in investing in airports for them? I think pictures um, say a thousand words. When I fly into an airport where I see cranes and construction equipment, I'm a happy guy. Because I realize that they're actually moving and building things. And how long that's going to last, I don't know. I was in Salt Lake City about four weeks ago, and they're about to embark on a multi-billion dollar project. And there are cranes everywhere. And I was in... Cleveland the other day, and Cleveland was de-hubbed by United, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, that's an economic decision on the part of the airlines. That hurt Cleveland a great deal. Now, what is Cleveland doing? They're rebounding. 
they're bringing in discount airlines. They, they still have an empty terminal. They're hoping to finish it. But you know what they're doing starting today? They're tearing the entire facade of the airport apart because guess what they're hosting next year? The Republican National Convention. And Cleveland, as a big city, and this is where I think we can work with the cities, is that the airports are gateways to cities. And they get rebuilt by the very people who are in this room and your, and your constituencies. And the message needs to go not only to members of Congress, but to mayors and city councilmen and commissioners about the need to wake Congress up to say, hey, you know, we realize this is a congressional uh, pr uh, process through reauthorization, but let us put our two cents worth in here, because if you don't act on this, we're screwed. Panel, mm -hmm. Joe. Um, Kevin, you put your finger on, on one of the, unfortunately, we are a multi-leg uh, creature. One of the Achilles heels of, of the transportation industry, I would argue generically, and we have for years, is the failure to tell the story. And, and the people that design and build the, the programs, uh, you know, in all respect, uh, tend to be, and, and the owners, they're, they're project oriented. I call it project-itis. They go out and get the job done, get it done on time, do a great job, and what do they do then? Move on to the next project. They never go back and tell the story. I've, I've always used the Wilson Bridge as a great example. Told the state DOTs, why aren't you going back after this multi-billion dollar investment and telling the world what the net benefits were after the fact? How it improved this, how it led to that. They don't, they don't do it. We do not do a good job of that. The airports, I, I, I would bet, are in the same case. I use BWI a lot. It's, the improvements they've made are wonderful. The experience is so much better. But are they going to the passengers and, and getting them and capturing that and telling the bloody world? I don't okay, know. Let me uh, follow up on that. Um, there might be, you might be onto something here in the fact that we have a captive audience. How many, how many of us have sat at the gates and they have TV monitors all over the place? When was the last time you saw an airport tell the fact that they brought in some local business, uh, the fact that they have a local brewery uh, right. right down the hallway that I've been trying my best to try all the local beers at various um, airports. Or um, Vivino or something like that. Maybe <laughs> have a scotch bar at one of these That's houses, right. you know. I got no problem with that. But, um, <laughs> I, was, I, I moderated a panel on airport sustainability. Airports are doing a fantastic job of making their facilities a lot more efficient, a lot more green, uh, beneficial to the environment, and also saving a heck of a lot of money as well. Passengers don't know it, and we talked about that. And, and think about the opportunities that airports have in having this, uh, this captive audience. We're talking about the, the benefits of the investments that have been made, maybe even talk about some of the opportunities or, you know, if there's a leaky ceiling or a uh, toilet isn't working, you know, this broken toilet is brought to you by a lack of, <laughs> right. of PFC. So <laughs> it's something we should, uh, right. Call something your we should uh, think yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. indeed. Put indeed. a little sign on the stall. Right. Question back here. Yeah. Um, actually, I want to take a crack at answering your question about how we change the conversation and get to members of Congress. Um, I think that it has a lot to do with they need to hear from their constituents. I mean, we can all go up to the Hill and say, this needs to be done, that needs to be done. That's great, but we're not in their district. We're not voting for them. They need to hear from their people. So one of the things that we tried to do, I'm with Building America's Future, is we created this um, free app. It's called I'm Stuck. And basically what it will do is allow people to be in a situation where they're stuck, if they're stuck in traffic, if they're stuck on an overcrowded metro, if they're stuck on a tarmac because they can't take off because there are 13 planes in front of them. Um, they, can, they can download it, they can send off an email to their member of Congress that basically has this preloaded message, and for airports it's raised the PFC, I'm sitting on a tarmac wasting time. <laughs> um, and you get a message back from your member of Congress. I mean, a lot of times it's a, it's a form letter, but they're hearing directly from a voter in their district. And we've been pretty lucky, we've had it downloaded in all, the, in all 50 states, over 12,000 emails have been sent, um, downloaded 16,000 times, so I think if we need to find ways to engage the public more to get to their member of Congress. So mm -hmm. that's a perfect tee up for what I want George to tell the group here. We have a bit of good news to spread about how we're getting the message out to 
the general public and specifically to members of Congress through travelers and through regular constituents. So George, why don't you explain to them our, as we like to call it internally, our shock and awe program. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Kevin. And thanks all, uh, to all of you for being here. Um, we're actually doing something similar. It's not an app, but it's, it's harnessing hey, George, the power of, of social George, media. Stand up. Oh, sorry. Uh, harnessing the power of social media, uh, using some vendors that have helped us identify it. basically a community of people who care about travel, who travel a lot, who messages like this, you know, keep my airports connected, upgrade my airport, that, that resonates with them. And so we, we created a, um, a campaign called Upgrade My Airport, and there's a website called Airport My Airport, UpgradeMyAirport.com. We encourage all of you to go. There's an opportunity to get, learn a lot about these issues that have been talked about today, file a, 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 sign a petition, which then will get routed to your member of Congress, and so that's how we're doing the, the grassroots pushes. The social media platforms allow us to push the message and for members to hear directly from constituents in their communities that care about this that are saying, yeah, I want you to upgrade my airport, increase the PFC, and protect the IIP because it matters to me. And the more they start hearing about that, uh, our goal is to, to, to drive up those numbers so that they start talking about it amongst themselves. They go to Schuster and talk about it, and it becomes one of those things that adds to everything that the panelists and Kevin have all talked about today that pushes them to do it, that creates that will that Pete talked about. Uh, why don't you s tell them a, a couple of the numbers that we've had on the, uh, at least on the YouTube. Can we, can we give those numbers out? Let me turn over to Scott Elmore, who's the yeah. guru Scott, of Scott's upgrade. Scott's the guy who's running this for us. Yeah. Sure. So um, petition signatures online right now are ranking at just under 12,000. We're 31 away from 12,000 signatures on our petition. And our video views on our YouTube channel are just over 450,000 video views. So we are really going out there and sharing the message about how the PFC works for passengers and how they can encourage their members of Congress to support it. And that was just prior to this week when we pushed the green light on the program that was targeting the congressional districts of the TNI committee members um, on, the, on the House side and the uh, Senate Commerce Committee on the, on the Senate side. So it's a, it's a laser focus on getting attention back to members of Congress that we're watching you. And this is what we're doing. Pete, you want to say something? Yeah, I would offer that, that, and I agree with everything that's been said. I, I think the real, you got to get the grassroots to communicate and put the pressure on the Congress to do something. And the administration, by the way, you know, you, you can't let anybody be AWOL on this thing. We're, we're doing the same thing for the highway and transit reauthorization at the moment. And, uh, but we've targeted leadership. And that's where it's really at. I mean, you know, with all respect, I think that if things are being held up, it's being held up by leadership on both houses. And so I would respectfully suggest that you, you focus even more attention uh, on leadership itself to make sure that we don't miss this deadline, which it sure looks like we might. Uh, they, they are controlling the agenda, and they're the ones that need to be told from folks back home and we did this the last two weeks. We had 50 radio ads Saturday and Sunday in nine key districts. And let me tell you, when they call you up and say, stop it, you son of a bitch, <laughs> well, that's what we're you, know, right. you know that, that they got the message. Now, George is popping out of his seat here. What do you want to say, George? Pete, great point, yeah. and leadership is on our list. Good, good. Yeah. Okay. Yep. One Steve? One. So, so agree, with the rest. agree with everything you're saying. Uh, but... The big piece, in, from my perspective, is the airlines, right? And people equate airports to airlines, sports arenas to sports teams, railways to railroads. <laughs> so it's very self-serving that contractors, architects, concessionaires are saying we need more money because it's serving our interests. It's, it's, it's the way I think it's being perceived, unfortunately. But without the airlines, it, it makes it really hard. And I worked for an airline, uh, seconded into an airline organization for, for many years, and there's a distrust. There's a distrust between the airline and the airport authority. Absolute distrust all over the country. It's, it undermines everything they're trying to do. Because they're looking for a total solution. They, they see inefficiencies, they see wasted money, you're taking my $4 or whatever it is in PFCs and you're wasting it on a roof that you've done really efficiently. I asked for something in January. I didn't get it until 18 months later. Uh, I didn't get my security upgrade. My branding is not being, is not being, uh, is not on the forefront. My hold rooms are no good because your process is inefficient. So it comes down to an element of control. I'll give you the money, but I want to control the process. I want to control where that money's going, 
how it's being spent, when it's being spent, and I want to know that it's being done efficiently. I don't think the airlines are against an $8 PFC. I think the airlines are against, I'm not going to give you more money to continue to be inefficient. And the airport authority is saying, what do you mean inefficient? Where's my inefficient? So there's just this de general distrust that I think that industry needs to get over. So, so what we're doing there, Steve, is you said a key word, their money. It's not their money. It's their passengers' money. And the reason why we're doing this is to say, look, you can, excuse the expression, bitch and complain all you want about $4 increase, but it's coming from the passenger. It's not coming from you. As a matter of fact, we have tremendous examples around the country where some of the biggest opponents of a PFC increase are the biggest users of PFCs. Take Delta, for example. They control most of the gates in Atlanta. They use the PFC to their tremendous advantage if it benefits Delta Airlines. But if it doesn't benefit Delta Airlines, they want nothing to do with it. They're doing the same thing up at SeaTac between the battle between Alaska and Delta. Mm -hmm. Okay? They're using PFCs. And one airline is opposed to it, the other one's supportive of it. But yet, when it benefits the individual airline, they're for it. But when it doesn't, they won't be. So as a public policy question for the airport association and trying to explain this to the members of Congress, if it's a fee that's paid by the passengers that keep upgrading the airports, okay, it's the passengers paying for it. it. It doesn't affect the bottom. As a matter of fact, I would argue it impacts positively the bottom line of an airline because the airline doesn't have to spend the capital expense, expend that amount of money to build a terminal. In some cases, they build their own terminal. But the airlines use the example of 10 airports in which they've, they've upgraded building their own terminal. That's it. That's all they've done. There are 300 or so commercial airports, 360 or so commercial airports in the United States. They've done it with 10. So what happens to the rest of them? What happens to the medium and small uh, hub airports that need the same help? So they like it when it helps them. They don't like it when it doesn't. But the messaging part of it is really about, hey, Mr. Airline Executive, it's not your money. It's not your money. And guess what? Airlines need to be fixed. Airports need to, oh, airlines need to be fixed too. But, but when, when, when they're talking about record profits, record low fuel prices, record amount of ancillary revenue that's coming from the airlines uh, because of the fact that they're making their profit, not so much on getting you from point A to point B. They're making it because all the other parts of it, the poor people who do not fly a lot, are paying the bulk of the bill. So. As I would say to any airline, I've said to Nick Kelly, you've got to be kidding me. You're fighting, and, and, and you hit the, the, uh, uh, the nail on the head, Steve. It is about control. And if, if, if the airlines got more control over the way that $4 went, they'd be happier. But the question is, if you gave them the control, we're at, we're at the mercy of airlines that happen to change. When I was in the, uh, the aviation summit, I brought up, and I'm sure I was a real hit about this, I mentioned, do you remember TWA? Do you remember Eastern? Do you remember Pan Am? Do you remember Independence Air? Do you remember? They're all gone, okay? But airports remain. So what happens when the airline goes and say US Air leaves Pittsburgh? Um, Pete's members help build Pittsburgh, okay? US Air leaves Pittsburgh and leaves 45 gates completely vacant. Pittsburgh still has to pay the note in that terminal, right? So the reality is, is that in the message coming from all these groups is it's not their money. It's money that passengers are using that are going through that actually come back through the local communities to your membership. And we can do a much better job explaining that um, and telling the, the average person flying that thank you for paying this, this addition to this terminal is thankful to you and the amount of traveling you're doing. And the other part of the message is, is it gets back to what uh, Lawson was talking about. It's a user fee, folks. It's only paid for by people who use it, people who never fly and decide they want to take a bus or a train. They don't pay this stuff. So, and it impacts TJ's group because guess what? As airports thrive, so do his. So I think we're running out of time here, so I got to wrap this up. But any more questions from the audience? But I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming here today, for staying here. Uh, most importantly, for thanking, I want to thank you for your association's participation in this coalition. We've come a long way in a very short period of time. And being the eternal optimist that I am, um, we're going to win this. We're going to go out there. I'm not going to go as far as Ove Ovechkin did the other day. But um, <laughs> poor guy, they lost by one guy. Ouch, right. Too soon. But, too but the, soon. the reality is, is that we're making tremendous progress uh, because of the very people in this room. But I want to thank you. So thank you for being here. And thank the panelists for their time and efforts. And let's go beat them. Thanks.